Hi, I'm Leia Ahava and I'm an autistic nerd. If you've never heard of headcanon, it refers to fan-made theories based upon clues found in a work. Um, in the case of autistic headcanons, that refers to the identification of autistic coded characters whose neurotypes are not confirmed as official canon. Um, for this series of videos, I'm going to stick to characters that I've not personally seen other creators discuss in headcanon videos in the past. I'm also going to only talk about characters who are 100% human because portraying autistics as aliens is a whole other can of worms. Uh, I do plan on making a whole series of these. Um, uh, the first show I'm going to talk about um, is called Fringe. Uh, if you've seen Fringe, you probably think I'm about to uh, talk about Walter Bishop as an autistic character, but that's where you'd be wrong. I've seen another creator list reasons they think Walter's autistic, but I vehemently disagree. Is Walter neurodivergent? Certainly. But autism is something you're born with, and Walter's neurodivergence is directly linked to having had chunks of his brain removed as an adult. It's acquired, and that means he isn't autistic. Uh, when those missing pieces are temporarily reconnected, he immediately starts thinking and acting exactly like Walternet, basically. And Walternet is not identifiably autistic, at least not to my read. Um, I would go so far as to say that labeling Walter as autistic is dangerous because there's enough factions out there who think we're broken humans uh, with missing pieces as it is. So if it's not Walter and it's not Astrid from over there since she's already explicitly autistic in the show, then who's left for a headcanon? Um, I've got two answers for that. Um, one, all versions of Astrid are autistic, not just the one who's canon autistic. And two, all versions of Olivia are too. So let's start with Astrid. Um, Astrid, uh, Farnsworth, uh, from over there, we already know can, is canon autistic. Um, and that's actually a tell for, about Astrid from over here. Uh, we know that autism has a genetic component, and the difference between these universes has to do with people's decisions and stories, not their genetics. Um, actress Jessica Nichols' sister is actually autistic, so it is reasonable to guess that uh, she is more aware than the average neurotypical of what fringe agent Astrid's neurotype is. Uh, would or could mean about FBI agent Astrid. Knowing this, let's look at the character before the introduction of her canon autistic double. I'll start by saying that she masks a lot. This is already common in autistic women, but we need to look at Astrid with more layers than that. And it's important to note that masking is pushed even more aggressively on neurodivergent people of color than it is on their white counterparts. Uh, link in the description for more information on that. Um, we also have to remember that Astrid has FBI training on top of any masking enforcement she would have faced growing up. Um, so where are the clues to Astrid's neurotype? I think it's notable that Astrid gets into the rhythm of working with Walter more seamlessly than might be expected of a neurotypical person. She really gets Walter in ways that most NTs don't even try with neurodivergent folk. And she thrives in the routines that she shares with him. She also makes instant connections that others don't such as when she notices that the bakery that Folivia's treats for Walter come from when she's supposed to have been at the federal building is actually in the Bronx. Um, and she demonstrates abilities in code breaking that reflect some level of similarity to her double. Um, there's a harmful stereotype about autistics that says that we don't experience empathy. 
For some, that may have an element of truth, but others, like Astrid, experience empathy in the extreme. Uh, Astrid is the heart of the fringe team. Olivia's ability to emotionally connect to others uh, fully is tampered, uh, sorry, tempered uh, by layers of trauma defenses. Peter shields his heart with cynicism. Walter loses touch with the idea of other people's humanity in his pursuit to the answer of whatever mystery he's solving. Broyles uh, is the big picture guy who's hardly in the field to meet anyone. But Astrid uh, is always connected. Astrid is the one who figures out why the young observer they meet in season one is upset, despite the fact that his attachment is to Olivia, not her. Astrid is the one who's concerned about the families of people who are yanked out of their world when Newton's experimenting uh, with moving buildings between universes. And Astrid is the one who figures out why her double crossed over to meet her and how to send her home with a sense of peace. I wish I had more to say about Astrid, but she really doesn't get nearly as much screen time as she should. Uh, she doesn't get um, episodes that are primarily focused on developing her as a character, other than the one uh, where the uh, when the doubles meet each other uh, in Making Angels, which is really more focused on Astrid from over there than it is on the one from over here. Um, so I'm stuck being both more brief and more vague in discussing her traits than Olivia's as a result. So what about Olivia? When we first meet her, we see someone who is far more direct with authority figures uh, than women are usually socialized to be, causing her to start the show butting heads with broils. She's extremely blunt in her communication style, but obviously that's not enough to say someone's autistic. Uh, because no version of Olivia is canon autistic, uh, we have to look at each version's traits. Uh, we see stark differences and also telling similarities between the different versions of Olivia Dunham. The most obvious difference between the two universes, regardless of timeline, is that Olivia from over here has experienced two kinds of childhood uh, abuse that Olivia from over there, or faux Olivia, did not. Uh, a violent stepfather and the Cortexafan trials. The show uses the violent stepfather as the thing that sets Olivia apart from the other Cortexafan kids and lets her succeed in crossing between universes. But what if that's not it? Uh, what if that combination of fear and love is indeed the catalyst, but only in certain brains? Uh, it's absurd to think that none of the other Cortexafan kids ever had that emotional mix while the drug was in their system, and yet none of them independently crossed over. Only Olivia did, so there's clearly something else that's different about Olivia. But... Uh, uh, other than the fact that her ability uh, to cross over come, happens to be dependent on her level of sensory input, um, uh, other than that, does that something else have to be autism? Let's look further. Um, Olivia's sensory differences extend beyond her unique response to cortexafan. Um, we also know that she had a restricted diet as a child, as she tells the young observer that she encounters in season one, uh, that she used to live on M&Ms. Packaged food items are common safe foods for autistics with limited, uh, palates because unlike fresh foods, they can be relied upon to taste and feel the same consistently. Olivia regularly jumps headfirst into plans that are inherently dangerous without taking the time to consider other possibilities or her own safety. Whether it's jumping into tanks of salt water with electronic probes in her neck while tripped up on LSD, or dashing to Jacksonville to retreat her cortexafan trauma for the benefit of others, she's quick to roll with whatever bizarre idea Walter comes up with in spite of Peter's protests. This cannot be accounted for by the need to move the plot forward because the show has long seasons of full-length episodes, which it takes its sweet time with for other developments. Uh, relying again on the fact that the different Olivias are genetically identical, 
Let's look at Olivia and faux Olivia together. Not all artistics are savants and not all savants are autistic, but it is worth mentioning that uh, Olivia um, has a near perfect memory aside from the cortexifan trials and faux Olivia is a savant level markswoman. She's a full-time fringe agent, and yet she has the level of practiced skill that it takes to be an Olympic medalist in marksmanship. It's also worth mentioning that Folivia's ability to succeed on almost um, a completely impromptu undercover mission impersonating a different version of herself with no prep, briefing, briefing or prior intel shows that uh, she is a champion level masker too. This points toward Olivia's masking behaviors going beyond trauma response alone. Neither of them are quick to trust others. They have to study people's behaviors and attitudes before building relationships. Um, FBI and fringe division training probably taught them these skills, but their effortless prowess at them and the way they apply them to relationship dynamics that are not strictly professional uh, points to the possibility that said training aligns with their natural wiring. Both Olivia's also stim with their hands when they're uh, masking strong emotions, such as when uh, she tours the facility in Jacksonville for the first time in season two, and when the two of them bicker with each other uh, at the very start of season four. Both of these instances follow the hand stimming with a behavior that's meant to mask it. In Jacksonville example, Olivia stops her hands from moving by crossing her arms. And on the bridge, both Olivia's still their hands by filling them with boxes of case files. Uh, I actually intended this to be a compilation video, but being one of my favorite series, Fringe actually kind of uh, took over. I do plan, to, as I said, to make more of these and hopefully those will end up being compilations where we talk about more than just one show. Um, so if you like this video, uh, subscribe and stay tuned for uh, more headcanons in the future. And leave your own headcanons in the comments or tell me what you think of mine. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching and uh, do, all of the, uh, do all the YouTube things if you liked it. I'll see you around. Bye!